Good evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on where you're watching from. Uh, please excuse my voice. Um, there's been there's been a little bit of an attack on my voice lately, obviously because the devil wants to shut me up. But Jesus has the victory. How many of us know that He is triumphant, no matter what? Um, so it doesn't matter what the devil throws in your direction, right? God already has the solution to your problem. He wants me to call this the power of a witness. I just want to share some things with you. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. But I like being transparent with people, right? Because there is power in a witness, right? So when we're transparent with people, not when we put on, you know, the shiny, polished, impressed church face. And you know what I'm talking about. I know you do. But when we're real with people and we share our struggles in the body of Christ, that's when things happen where people are actually encouraged and empowered and strengthened and feel like they can go on for another day because, wow, okay, this person is really going through some stuff but yet i see this faith and yet i see this person being able to encourage other people while going through some stuff themselves that is the kind of thing that we need to see in in the body we don't we don't need the facade we don't need fake phony you know personas we don't need that in the body of christ we need rawness we need transparency we need somebody to get on the screen and and talk about you know your your struggles and your battles and how god helps you overcome each and every one so that's what i'm here to do today so uh for those of you that don't know if you're new to the channel i have been living in a hotel for a year now a year and so I get the question all the time you know are you looking for another place no no I am not I am right where God wants me to be I just go outside and I open my mouth and he uses me as a physical mouthpiece on the earth and he speaks to people and he tells them whatever he needs to hear and I'm watching him move in on the hearts of people every single time I turn around it's amazing. Um, for the last five months, there's been this season of nothing but just um, week by week to sometimes three appointments in a day of uh, deliverance, of discipleship, of Bible studies, of even just uh, somebody that has some questions, right? They have some questions about the Bible or they have some questions about how to pray or what fasting means, right? Um, so the Lord knows that my time is his time and I will make myself readily available. But how many of us know that the reason why we grow weary in our well-doing is number one, some of us like to people please. And if you like to people please, you don't know how to tell people no. And then there's another thing that we do as well, and that is when we have uh, not established boundaries or we don't know how to establish boundaries or maybe we don't even know how to keep them. We might set them up, we might set the parameters and then be like, well, you know, this person really needs help. It's like, no, sometimes it's okay to tell somebody, no, I can't see you today because I've already, I've talked to four people today and now I need to go sit at the feet of Jesus, right? Because if we, you strive in your own strength, that is where you become weary in your well-doing. If you strive in your own strength, that is where you become depleted that's why the bible says come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and i will give you rest rest doesn't mean go take a nap i know it it seems like um the perfect option when you know your your tank is on e so to speak and you're flagging right but that is precisely the time when we need to be in prayer and right now i don't know if you know this or not um, but there is a huge attack on people, especially, you know, the devil's never up to new tricks. Um, he, he uses what, what seems to work. So if he's been throwing all the things that you used to go after in your face and you're resisting the devil and he flees every single time, then he has to figure out a new way 
um, to try to come at you. So what he tries to do is he tries to wear out the saints. Now he can do this one of many ways. Number one, he can use the fact that you're a people pleaser against you. Number two, he can use the fact that you have a lack of discernment. So all of a sudden you think that all of these people that he's sending your way are all people that he sent without checking and we have to test every spirit we have to check lord is this my assignment or not otherwise people could be sent to distract you from your actual assignment people could be sent to distract you um you know where where they say they have an interest in in establishing a closer relationship with god and they really don't all right so that's why we need we need discernment that's why we need to be spirit led not led by our flesh by holy spirit have your way you know if this is my assignment I'll, I'll see four people a day and if it's not uh, and I need to steadfastly find some some balance here then please let me know uh, that being said uh, there has been times where the Lord has literally uh, put me in a place where I, I've, I've either got a headache or I'm just not feeling well to slow me down to say, hey, you can't do it all. You're only one person. And it's okay to tell people, you know what, I really can't see you today. And I'm sorry that you, you really do need someone. Um, but I have to establish boundaries. And I have to be able to know that it's okay to put up those boundaries and, and keep them. And that's going to be okay. Now, some people aren't going to like that. And that's fine. But what we need to remember is that the world doesn't revolve around any one single person. There are a lot of people out there that need help. And we can't pour out of an empty vessel. We can't pour out of an empty vessel. Right? The Lord is the one who gives might to those who have no strength. The Lord is the one that gives us rest. We must decrease. We must come low. We must humble ourselves for Him, to, His Spirit to decrease. I mean, for His Spirit to increase in us. We must decrease for Him to increase. Hallelujah. So I want to share something with you. Um, as a result of being in the hotel, again, for those of you that don't know, um, I used to be a bit of a workaholic, okay, before I got saved, before I had a relationship with Jesus Christ, I actually kind of uh, formed my, my identity around moving up in the corporate ladder, um, getting promoted, making money, being one of the hardest workers. I prided myself on those things, and the Lord knew, knew this. So he had to he had to strip away my pride and one of the ways that he's stripping away my pride is he he took away some things right because that's what God is going to come and do um and when you give your life to Christ understand that you you died right you died to your old life so that now you can live for Christ you are not your own you were bought at a price right and we need to count the cost of denying ourselves, because that's what it means when we're a Christian. We are to deny ourselves, deny what we want, deny the the little blueprint that all of us had mapped out on how our life was going to go and what kind of career we were going to get into and what school we were going to go to and what we were going to study. But you know what? If it's not God's plan, throw it out. I'm going to say that again. If it's not God's plan, if it's not Yahweh's plan, if it's not the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings directing your life, throw out what, whatever plan you have. Okay? Because God's plan will always be a thousand times better. The Lord wants to use you. He didn't just save you so that you can get into heaven. Like, like you know, the golden ticket in the Willy Wonka chocolate factory. No, it's a little bit more than that. We deny ourselves. So that we can live for Christ. And so that we can do good works. We're now enabled to do good works by God's grace. By placing our faith and trust in the finished work of the cross. The shed blood and death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's how we're enabled to do good works. He gave us his spirit. God gave us his spirit. 
the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead comes to dwell in every born again believer who has repented and believed in the gospel. Not just believe, but you have to actually repent of your sin. Repent is not an apology. Repent is not, I'm sorry, God, I'll never do it again. It's just a conscious decision. I'm turning away from that life and I'm fixing my face like a flint on Jesus. And I'm trusting him to get me through until the end. Enduring, having done all to stand. Amen. That's what it's about. Enduring, having done all to stand. Realizing that you are now standing on the rock of your salvation. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. You want God's plan. Find out what God's plan is. And the best way that you can do that is to start to deny what your flesh wants. Right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So, number one in this walk, when you, when you hop over the fence, when you decide that you no longer want to serve the devil, because that's basically what it is. There's, you, can, you can't serve two masters. You either serve Jesus Christ, you either serve God, or you serve the devil. There's no in between. There's no in between. All right, I know some people are kind of on the fence and still being drawn into the world. That's okay. Once you come to Christ, there is a waging war that happens within you, right? The Bible talks about this waging war happening where I want to do what I want to do what's right. But then there's a there's another thing at war within my members and it's raging war against the spirit. Right, we're made of body, flesh, and spirit. Your spirit becomes one with the Holy Spirit when you are truly born again. But your flesh is still fallen. And your flesh is going to fight you every step of the way when you try to pray. Your flesh, your flesh is going to fight you every step of the way when you try to get in your Bible. Why? Because we're sanctified by the word, meaning made holy, set apart. God has work for you to do. But he's got to strip you of self, your carnal self. And he does it through many different things. Fasting crucifies the flesh. Fasting is not just skipping a couple meals. When you fast, what you're doing is you're denying again what your flesh wants. I want to eat, but I'm not going to eat for a period of time. I'm going to dedicate that time to God that I'm not eating. I'm going to dedicate that time to God in prayer. I'm going to dedicate that time to God in worship and getting in the Lord's presence, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And I'm going to have an idea in mind of something that I want to break off of my life, whether it be a, a stronghold, a compulsive habit, a, an addiction, a sin that you keep going back to like a, a dog goes back to its vomit. Or like the Israelites did when they kept looking back at Egypt and thinking it was, it was better back there. It's not, I promise you. So again, I've been in a hotel for uh, about a year. And it's been quite the journey because I was very uh, proud of my independence in the world. That I didn't have to ask anybody for anything. If I needed something, I could go get it for myself. If my job wasn't paying me enough, I was bound and determined to go in there and show them why it was worth more money. And if I couldn't get the more money, then I would, you know, I would look to... Uh, get promoted within the company and, and, and move up or take on a second job or work myself into the ground to accomplish what it is that I wanted to do. So one of the first things that God does is he strips you of self. He starts taking things away. He starts taking away your friends and your inner circle. I can't have you hanging around with those people anymore. I brought you out of the world. Hallelujah. I set you apart for a time such as this and I want to use you. You can't be hanging around with these people I need to get you in with some like-minded individuals who can mentor you and disciple you and get you ready and prepared for what I have for you says the Lord hallelujah that's what God wants to do 
with each and every one of you that is willing to surrender and yield and submit. So that's what I've done in this season. Now, people thought I was crazy when I walked away from a salary paying job with no other options lined up. I wasn't looking for anything else. I felt the call of God. I left. Then I started moving. And what was crazy is that God would show me how he would supernaturally provide. But the places that he was leading me to were assignments. There were people that were lukewarm and needed their fire back. I'm not the one giving them their fire back. But they saw mine and it sparked something in them. And it was all the work of the Lord. It was all the work of the Lord. I take zero credit for it, but I love to be a part of it. I love to see people get that fire back when they were they 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 were losing that spark. They were losing their desire. They were almost becoming apathetic about the things of God, just not really feeling the worship anymore, not praying as much, not reading their Bible. Maybe their Bible started becoming boring to them. If your Bible starts to become boring to you, Check yourself for a spirit of apathy and renounce it and command it to go in Jesus' name. So again, the Lord has had to stretch my faith in the season. So not only has he stripped me of some things, he took my car. I wasn't happy about that, to be honest with you. But the Lord was trying to show me something. Everything on this earth belongs to me, Angela. So be thankful for the things that you have when you have them. I give it and I take it away. And if I take something away, just trust that even though you don't have your own transportation on paper, that I will make sure that you get to and from where you need to go. And I've watched it happen. Uber is not cheap. Lyft is not cheap. But there was one time um, when I found this new church that I was literally going to church events almost five days a week. And the Lord made a way for me to be at every single one of them. And I was, I was amazed. But I was like, wow, Lord, just, just keep using me because I'm seeing these things happen where, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in an environment where the majority of people that come in and out of here are in transition a lot of them don't know where they're going next many of them have been here for months and months and months they're homeless they're waiting for something to open up a lot of them have been um they, you, they've admitted to me that they're struggling with addictions i've prayed over people i i've sat there and people have given their life to Christ. I, I've watched people get healed on the spot in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the name above any other name. Hallelujah. And it's amazing. But it's, it's nerve-wracking, so I'm not going to lie. It's, it's been stressful. Number one, if you've ever lived in a hotel, you know, and you don't have a car, if you don't get up and, and start walking around, you can easily fall into the trap of idleness, laziness, stagnancy. Those are all spirits, by the way. Yeah, part of it is your flesh, but another part of it, when it's when it's when you have zero control over something and you start to feel like you're just in a rut and you can't get out, that's when you know there's spirits at work. There's a spiritual battle that we're in, right? And so there were times where I had to fight off depression. There were times where I had to fight off boredom, right? Because I, there's just been different seasons that I've been in. So I, I would go outside and I would look for people to minister to. But recently, about five months ago, the Lord had me pull out of all the church activities. That, that, that's where the boredom came in at first because I'm like, what? Like, I left the church. I had a discipleship group that I was in, a discipleship class that I was in on Thursdays, prayer meeting on Friday that went through, uh, you know, sometimes four hours through the night, um, a Wednesday Bible study. So there was a good amount of activities, uh, evangelism on Sundays, church. So there were all these things. Right. And then the Lord said, I need you to come out of those. And I didn't really understand what, why. 
but God's ways are not always going to make sense to you. And he's not always going to tell you why. He's just going to say, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you know that my plans for you are good to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope? If you know this and you believe this, you'll just do it. So I pulled out of there and this woman from New Jersey sent me something shortly after one of my prayers was, I need to get more organized, Lord. I need to be more orderly. I feel like, you know, ever since COVID or something that I, I lost that, I used to be very organized and orderly when I was at work, but now I'm trying to do it outside of the work environment. And for whatever reason, I was struggling. So I said, I need some help. So this girl from New Jersey, she sends me this bag with all of these organizational materials. She sent me everything from to-do lists, to uh, journaling, to um, a blank planner with uh, stickers for dates and days and months and all of that. But as soon as I started setting up the planner, I posted a video that he, he gave me a word. And I believe the word was called, you're coming out. Um, and it was very encouraging. It was specifically for people who are going through intense spiritual warfare where the Lord was saying, doesn't matter how deep of a, a ditch you crawled into, that he was going to literally just reach in and pull them out. And so what started happening is I started to get all of these emails of people saying, I need deliverance, I need deliverance. And I tried to, you know, respond to as many of them as I could. It was a lot. And I'm only one person. But then I started, you know, seeing on average about two people a day. On average, the calls were about four to five hours. And sometimes they would go on longer than that. Because I really want to see people free. I, I, love, I love deliverance. I love watching the Lord break generational strongholds that took decades to build in a matter of like 10, 15 minutes. That's amazing. Um, but, you know, the deliverance part sometimes can be short. And other times they put up quite a fight and the Lord will let that go on because I know he could kick them out at any time but I truly believe he lets it go on because it's part of the training you're in deliverance boot camp my friend so he, he wants you to learn a thing or two and that's why it gets dragged out so I'm learning a lot about deliverance I'm learning a lot about discipleship I'm meeting with, you know, uh, many different people with uh, many different things that they're battling. So, yeah, it's learn as you go, right? We're to study to show ourselves approved. The reason why we study is so that we can either teach or share the gospel or disciple someone else, right? You can't disciple someone else unless you truly understand uh, what, what you've been taught and you've been taught well. You had a good mentor, right? Amen. Um, so the Lord has supernaturally provided, but there's been days literally where he doesn't provide, you know, a week at a time. Sometimes he does provide a week at a time. And I'm like, huh, and I, you know, I can breathe and I can focus on the work at hand and not really worry about how I'm going to eat and know that I can do my laundry this week and the room is paid and all of that. And other times I'm like, oh man. You know, because God is doing a new thing and sometimes he will literally make sure it's there by the day. But how many of us know that God, when he wants to stretch your faith and test your faith and strengthen your faith, he does it by waiting till the last minute. So there's been times where, you know, check out at 11 and I waited up until 1045 sometimes. Another time help didn't come until about 1130, but my room was still available. So uh, the Lord's like, I don't, I don't need your help just because your bank account is in the negative means nothing for me. Just because you don't have a car doesn't mean that I can't get you to where I want you to be. He makes a way. Um, but again, 
doubt can creep in unbelief can creep in and that is a hindrance because what happened when jesus went into nazareth which was his hometown right and i know people probably heard word of mouth gets around fast right people probably heard about all the mighty miracles that he did and he marveled at their unbelief and he could only heal a handful of people in that place because they didn't have the faith to believe that he could do what he had been doing all over the place for many others he could only heal a handful of people and so the bible actually says do not even think that a, that god will answer a prayer on something that you don't even believe yourself that he's going to come through so there's been many times where the holy spirit has stopped me before i prayed and said renounce renounce doubt renounce unbelief that's why nothing's coming through because you don't even believe what you're praying for angela am i able or not do you believe my promises or not do i keep my word do i keep covenant or do i break it what does my word say what does my word say that's a word for somebody today what does God's word say? I, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. But what does God's word say? Right? Maybe maybe God's silent. Maybe you can't hear him right now. And you think he left. You you think God's mad at you. You think you really did it this time. You think that you, you've you been in woeful sin for, for so long that He's he's discarded you. Now the Lord can give you over to the enemy for a season. But a lot of times it's to bring you to a place of repentance. His kindness is also meant to draw us to repentance. But when that doesn't work and you've been living in willful sin long enough, yes, he can, he can hand you over to that depravity to show you why you didn't want it in the first place. And why whatever you thought was so harmless or not that bad really is a whole lot worse than you thought because sin has no end to it it's like a deep pit you just keep falling deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the depths of despair and anguish and shame and guilt so the lord has really been putting me in a place where number one he's been humbling me where I am no longer taking care of myself and I can't. So if God doesn't do it, it doesn't get done. If God doesn't do it, it doesn't get done. But if it's his will, he'll take care of it. And I'm just learning to trust and rely on and be fully dependent on him. No matter what my flesh is doing in that moment. Because my flesh might be screaming like, God... Can't you see I'm drowning? Hurry up. Wake up. Just like they did with Jesus on the boat. Don't you see these enormous waves? We're about to die and you want to take a nap? And then he just easily rebukes the wind and the waves within seconds and says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So God, he, he, he wants to get you prepared for something. But... The season that he wants to bring you into requires a greater level of faith. That's why a lot of you are really going through it right now. And you're just like, why does it feel like I'm getting hit from all angles of life? Why every single time I think that I'm going to, you know, finally break through, I take two steps forward and end up taking 10 steps backwards. What is really going on? The Lord wants to pull something out of you that you don't even think you're capable of. And he does it with adversity. He does it with hardship. He does it in those uncertain moments where you're like, what am I going to do now? So, <laughs> the, the hotel rate right now is a... Is, it gets up to almost two hundred dollars a night, and yes, it was it was much easier 
it was much easier if I'm being honest to just have that 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 money available and be able to go and do whatever it is that I wanted to do but that is not God's will for my life God's will for my life right now is for me to be here in this hotel where there is a great need for him for his love to be to, to be spread around like an airborne virus he is our blessed Jesus Christ is our blessed hope and this this place has a hope deficit we'll just leave it at that and I watch it all the time where you know I'll walk up to somebody and I'll start talking to them and they've got zero hope on their face and all their joy has just been choked out it's been drained they feel like they've got nothing left to give they don't see any light at the end of the tunnel whatsoever. They're, they're in this, this place of complete despair and hopelessness and anguish. Probably angry at God. A lot of them, they get angry at God. Why are you doing this to me? It's all preparation for the course. Why does God let certain things happen to us? Why do us, does he put us in certain seasons? Because you are graced. You are graced for a, a specific, I don't want to call it an audience, but a specific group of people that no one else can reach. You are graced for a specific location that he wants to send you to. You are graced to witness, to bear witness about what he has done in your life. And they will listen because you've lived through many of the things that they have either been through or are still going through. That's the only reason why they're going to listen to you. Is because you can relate. And because you made it out on the other side. It gives them hope. It encourages them. It makes them feel like they can go on another day. Especially if they were contemplating death or suicide. Amen. So what does God's word say? When, when, when God goes silent and you can't hear him, why doesn't God talk to me anymore? I used to be able to hear from him. Now he's gone silent. I really need answers. What is God saying? All of a sudden we start to get itching ears and run to the next prophet because God's not speaking. But what does he say as you're sitting there thinking, I think God left. What happened when they thought that Moses left? Right, they made themselves a golden calf. The people made themselves a golden calf out of all their jewelry. Because they're like, well, if Moses isn't going to lead us, well, we need somebody. Hurry, quick, make a God. That's what we do when we start trying to find solutions to our problems in other ways when God is not answering us in a timely fashion. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be still and know he is God. Be still and know he is able. You might not be, but he has zero limitations. You might be weary in your well-doing. You might be tired, but he doesn't need sleep. You might be on some sort of a timeline and worried if he doesn't meet it, but he's outside of time and time does not matter to him. It's not important. He's already got it worked out. He knows the end from the beginning. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Nothing surprises God. So if he's silent, does it mean that he left you? What does God's word say? It says, I will never leave or forsake you. Or maybe you think because, you know, you, you've been falling into the same sin over and over again. And now the devil's chirping in your ear and telling you that you're going to hell. But there is there, therefore now no condemnation in Christ. Are you in Christ? Are you dying to yourself a little bit every day? Are you producing fruit? If you're a fruitless tree, then you have to worry about being cut at the root. If, if, you're, not, if you're not growing, there, there's, there's no fruit. If there's no progression, if there's no change in your life, well, that indicates somebody that hasn't been born again. Now, doesn't it? And Jesus told Nicodemus, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven or even see it, you must be born again. You must be born again. That means you need to have spiritual eyes to see. Did you hear that? You can't even see the kingdom of heaven. Never mind, enter in.
unless you have been born again. You need spiritual eyes to see. The Bible is a spiritual book. So you need to be able to spiritually discern through the Holy Spirit what you're reading. Otherwise, you, you're you just going to be worried about context. You're just going to be worried about context and you're not going to realize that Jesus is the word made flesh and he can speak to you any way he wants in the Bible. And in that moment, he's just speaking to you. It's not about context at that moment. It's him telling you something specifically about your situation or showing you that there are many other people who were men and women of God throughout the Bible who went through similar had similar uh, worries and concerns and insecurities right men and women of God that God used mightily that had the same hindrances that you and I have amen so I just want to share something with you really quickly. Uh, <laughs> the Lord broke a stronghold of nervousness off of me. Now, I can tell you this. I know this came in at a ver very early age. Uh, the spirit of fear pretty much dominated me um, before I was saved. You know, I had an anxiety. I had social anxiety. I was afraid of everything my own shadow part of that is because I was always watching scary stuff you know what I mean you want to sit there and watch a bunch of horror movies don't be surprised when a spirit of fear attaches to you a spirit of fear can also come in when your environment is not so secure a spirit of fear can attach to a child when mom is getting beat up and the child feels helpless and can't do anything about it and so they're scared and that spirit of fear attaches so I had a stronghold of nervousness and strongholds, again, they take decades to build, right? That could have started from the womb and, and been to now. And Jesus broke it in about 15 minutes, if that. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So under the stronghold of nervousness was a spirit of nervousness, fear, fearfulness, apprehension, insecurity, timidity, shyness awkwardness social awkwardness anxiety and um just so you know spirits you know they they lie dormant a lot of times so um these are not things that were like characteristics that were all the time that's why i always thought that you know because they they called it uh, textbook like bipolar disorder right the the world always has a name for it but they don't realize that it's spiritual it's spiritual when your moods are all over the place, right? And you can't shut off your brain in order to be able to go to sleep. And you're being insult assaulted with intrusive thoughts all day. That's a spiritual battle. You don't need medication. You need Jesus. Amen. Now, medication may work for some. But I really just believe that it sedates the demons and if it is your flesh your flesh needs to be crucified anyway and medication can actually open you up to worse things we know that just by the commercials for example somebody takes medication right and you're just trying to get to sleep at night melatonin wasn't working so you went to the next best thing you went to the doctor they gave you a prescription all of a sudden you start taking it but there's a list of 20 different side effects so it might help you sleep but you could have and they'll say these things like bleeding ulcers and all this other stuff no thanks thanks but no thanks jesus is the great physician Okay, by his 39 stripes, I am healed. What does God's word say? I'm standing on that. I have no idea how I'm going to be able to pay for my room. But what does God's word say? He says that I will never leave or forsake you. He says that God's word says that if you ask me for bread, I will not give you a stone. 
And if you ask for a fish, I will not give you a serpent or a snake. What does God's word say? It says, do not fear, just believe. What does God's word say? It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. What does God's word say? It says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. What does God's word say? It says, I am your present help in times of trouble. I'm going to believe God before I start to believe my, my fears. Amen. Back to the stronghold. After social awkwardness was anxiety, tension, shakiness uncertainty unrest restlessness panic overwhelmingness discomfort distress disturbance edginess franticness stress vexation worry tribulation there were a couple word curses one of them was um, somebody spoke cold feet over me I think that was right before I got married uh, and the other two the other two were the words trouble and troubled. So I, I was referred to being a troubled kid many times or, or saying that I, I was trouble and uh, nobody wanted their, their daughter or son to, to hang out with me at a certain point, um, right around like 12 years old. Um, and so those needed to be broken in Jesus' name, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what was in people's hearts was being spoken over me by a spirit. That spirit was influencing that person, speaking nothing but death, insults, and criticism over me. Cursing my life. And so Jesus became a curse to free us from the curse. But contrary to popular belief, all generational curses do not break off the minute that you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay, they can be broken in Jesus' name, but you have to actually know what is there, and he will break them. He has a divine timeline. God has a divine timeline for everything, and he does it in his perfect timing, not ours. The other spirits that were under the stronghold of nervousness were desperation, anxiousness, concern, and apprehensiveness. He broke that in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. The other one that's... Uh, it was really giving me some trouble. <laughs> was a. Let me just make sure here. Yes. A stronghold of inactivity. My Lord. Yeah. A stronghold of inactivity. And so when I. I think I was about 11 or 12, uh, I became severely depressed. And even in my teenage years, when everybody else should be out there living their best life, as they say, right? Um, I was tired. I was depressed. I wanted to sleep all day. I had zero energy. When those, when those spirits would take over, I was just depleted and didn't even know why. And people started saying, like, you never want to do nothing. So there was a strong man of inactivity that needed to be bound and his goods plundered in Jesus' mighty name. Spirits of inactivity, stagnancy, boredom, isolation, disinterest, passiveness, laziness, sluggishness, slothfulness, idleness, stillness, nonchalance, irresponsibility, lethargy, poverty, lack, oppression, depression, Unforgiveness was there. Shame, guilt, blame, regret, disappointment, discouragement, anger, frustration, self-criticism, self-accusation, self-hatred, self-loathing. These were all the feelings that I had from that inactivity and not having the energy to do anything. Self-rejection, disgust, discontent, self-pity, victimization, where you have that like victim mentality. You know, I'm, I'm this way because it's your fault and you start, you know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren, but you start pointing fingers and blaming everybody else. But at some point, we got to start taking accountability for our own choices and stop blaming everybody else. And, and the Bible says we don't even wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, 
principalities, rulers of wickedness in heavenly places. There was also a spirit of isolation, suicide, death, and torment. For those of you that don't know, by the time I was 22, I tried to take my life twice. Okay, a spirit of death. There was something trying to kill me for a very long time. It is only by the grace of God and his mercy that I'm standing here today. And I can tell you that confidently because I lost count of how many times I came dangerously close to dying. And if it wasn't for God and his hand on my life. And he was protecting me at a time when I had zero desire to even know him. Zero desire to look for him. Seek and search for him. Go to a church. Open a Bible. Pray. None of that. But by his grace and his mercy and his unfailing love, he never gave up on me. And if you think that God is going to give up on you, as long as you are trying to abide in him, you're seeking and searching for him, God is not going to give up on you. You are now accepted in the beloved as his child. You have been made a child of God. If you have been born again, you went from a child of wrath to a child of God. You went from being in deep darkness to being ripped out of that into his marvelous light. You, bet, you went from being at enmity with God and actually an enemy of his, an enemy of the cross of Christ. To if you are obeying his, his commands. And his command is simply this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love him with everything in you and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. If you obey that command right there, you have the right to call God friend. Hallelujah. All I want to hear from the Lord at the end of the day through all of this is well done good and faithful servant. I don't need a title. I, I don't I don't need recognition. I don't need a name. I, I don't need fame. I don't need popularity. None of that stuff matters to me. It did in the world. I died to that. I could care less about that. I want to make Jesus famous though. I want him to be known. I want the love of Christ to be spread around every place where I plant my feet like an airborne virus. Hallelujah. Because of the spirit of God that now lives on the inside of me. He is our blessed hope, hope beyond the grave. And you take that hope with you wherever you go. Hallelujah. You take that hope with you wherever you go. If you've got the gift of faith, you take that gift of faith with you wherever you go. When you open your mouth, people that didn't even have faith, it jumps on them. That's how good the God is that we serve. And he can, he can invade a heart in moments. So if you've got somebody right now and, and you're just you're worried about them because you know we're in the last days and you know Jesus could crack the sky and come back and no one knows the day or the hour except the Father. And we got to be ready and we got to be sober and watchful. Yes, but just know this. There is no one, no matter how hard their heart is, no matter how deep in darkness they are, no matter how much of a reprobate they have become, that if you are not praying for them, like if you're, if you're praying for them on a consistent basis, if you're praying for them and you're interceding for them, the Bible says the prayers of the righteous avail much. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. And God is not a man that he should lie. Your prayers carry weight as a child of God. And if you're praying and it's not just you and other people are coming into agreement with that prayer and you know they're warriors for Christ, that's all you need. You can, you can almost bet on intercession on, in that person's life because the only reason I'm here today and I guarantee it is because the Lord put it on somebody's heart and it wasn't my mom. It wasn't my mom. My mom was very much worldly. She wasn't even saved yet. So it wasn't her praying for me. I have no idea who it was. It wasn't my grandparents. But somebody was out there praying for me. And that's the only reason that I was spared. Somebody interceded for me. I know this because God will actually, he will wake up his saints in the middle of the night. Listen to this. This is how good God is. 
He'll wake up his saints in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock and tell them to pray for somebody they don't even know. Show them their face. Show them a circumstance or a situation that they've gotten themselves into where they might be in danger and say, pray for this person. Okay, so God doesn't, he doesn't leave or forsake you. He doesn't abandon you. You are not, you are not rejected by God as long as you are abiding in Christ. Your righteousness apart from Christ is filthy rags, right? We, we can't save ourselves. Good people don't get into heaven. Saved people do. Okay, the, the only thing that makes us holy is the Holy Spirit. That's the, the, the Holy Spirit. I don't I want to call him a thing. So he is a person. The Holy Spirit makes us holy. Not your dress code. Not the fact that you don't wear earrings or makeup. Not your head covering. Not your holier than thou attitude. Not your self-righteousness. The Holy Spirit. What Jesus did on the cross. The invisible God made visible. God incarnate. That's what makes us holy. Putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And receiving the same spirit that raised him from the dead. Not the fact that you tithe 10% every week or more. That doesn't make you holy. Not when you're checking off your little religious boxes. For your good deeds for the day. Again, good people do not get saved. They don't get into heaven. Saved people get into heaven. Good people don't. Because none of us are good. God looked down on the earth during the days of Noah and said, No one is good. No, not one. All have become corrupt. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And when we start to say, Well, I, I haven't sinned like they have. Then you're falling into the dangerous game of comparison. And that's a sin. God doesn't want us comparing ourselves to somebody else's sins. Sin is sin. It will be punished wherever the Lord finds it. But just know that his chastisement is proof of his love. Because if he's not chastising you, well, then I'd be a little worried. But if he's chastising you, that means that God knows your potential. He knows what he placed on the inside of you. He knows what he's draw he wants to produce out of you, to draw out of you. He knows exactly the circumstances that are going to take place. That is going to, to bring you to that place of persevering. Where you stop striving in your own strength and you, you start depending and relying on his and when you abide in Christ and you let the Holy Spirit lead you and you seek and search for God with your whole heart and you draw near to him like the Bible says to do and you meditate on his word day and night. You let that word get on the inside of you and you apply it when you go out. He will do the rest. He will give you the strength and the might and everything else you need. To be successful. We can't do anything. Apart from Jesus. Has this been easy. To live in a hotel. And have just, just a room. I'm grateful for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm very grateful for it. But it's easy to get idle. It's easy to get bored. It's easy to get lazy. But you remember what Jesus said to that man. Who was infirm for 38 years. You imagine being sick for 38 years. And the Lord just comes up and says. Do you want to be healed? Because if I heal you. And you're used to people taking care of you. Now you have to get used to. Doing things on your own. Because you can. That's why he asked him that question. Was to reflect. What, what, what does this healing come with? What does salvation come with? We got to count the cost. Do you, do you build a house? 
without count, counting the cost for the materials? No, because what would happen? You would run out of materials and you wouldn't finish the house. So the Bible says it's important to count the cost. We'll never know the cost of what Christ paid for us. And picking up our cross and following him. Everybody has a different cross. Nobody's cross is the same. We are all expected to go through different trials and tribulations and hardships and persecutions. Sometimes even imprisonment. Look at Paul and Silas. But instead of Paul and Silas throwing a poor me pity party in jail, what did they do? They worshiped the Lord anyway. And what happened when they worshiped the Lord? The prison walls came down. And those prisoners could have left. They could have taken off. We're free. We're getting out of here. But they wanted to be in the presence of the Lord. They were in the presence of the Lord with Paul and Silas when, when they were praising God. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. So they were ushering in God's presence. Why would they want to be anywhere else? If it's between anywhere else and being in the presence of the Lord, give me the presence of the Lord. But this might really speak to somebody today. I didn't know if you know this or not. It's great to do things. For God, like, you know, the story of Mary and Martha. Well, Martha was all about the doing. And the, the work that needed to be done. Right? And Mary just wanted to lay at the feet of Jesus. But Jesus said, Mary picked the better part. Why? Again, because we have to lo love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength first. We don't want to make an idol out of the work of God. And the Lord showed me that I could do that. He, he showed me that I could actually make working for him an idol. And an idol is really just something that takes up more time. Or more, more, more of your mind than the Lord. Yes, there's work that needs to be done. There's a, a lot of people that need deliverance. There's a lot of people that need healing and discipleship and Bible studies and all of that. But we have to make sure that we do not neglect our relationship with the Lord and start making the work to be done an idol. I know that's a word for somebody today. And I know that the Lord is going to bring the right individual here to hear it. Amen. So I hope you all are well. I pray this was a, a blessing to you and that it ministered to you through whatever season you're in and just let you know that God is faithful and he's going to get you through. You don't have to know the how. You don't have to know the why. You don't have to know the when. Now that's our flesh that wants all these answers. But God isn't going to give you those answers. Sometimes he will answer little bits and pieces. But he's never going to show you the full picture. Because the truth is if he showed you <laughs> some of you what he wants to take you into. You would do the 50-yard dash in the opposite direction because you'd be like, nah, I didn't sign up for that. But he needs to make sure that he prepares your heart and, and builds up your faith to the extent that it needs to be for where he wants to take you. Amen? So I hope you all have a, a, a good night. And please um, drop in the comments if you if you need any prayer. God bless you all.